Welcome. We're so glad you joined us for this week's podcast from Pursuit City Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. Our prayer is that you are both encouraged and challenged in your relationship with Jesus. If you need prayer or want to share a story of what God has done in your life, please send an email to amen at pursuitcc.com. Be blessed with today's message. Amen. We're going to jump right into our second week of uh, Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. If you weren't here last week, you missed out. That's all I got to say. You missed out. Uh, We're going to get that video up as soon as possible. I was just, we had to leave Sunday or that next day, actually, Monday morning. So we were packing Sunday. I didn't get a chance to get the video uploaded. So we'll get that uploaded quickly. And right after that, we'll get this one uploaded so that you can go back and look. Because I got a lot of info for you. This is one of those mornings where you want to get your worship guides out and you want to write notes on the back. Okay, this is one of those mornings. So we're going to just dive right in. I only got like three scriptures. Two of them are in the system. The other one is just we're going to talk about a scripture. The rest is just what I have to say this morning. Amen. Let's do this. Let's pray, and then we'll jump right in. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it does. We thank you that it enlightens us. It empowers us. It strengthens us. It corrects us. Father, we thank you that uh, the teaching of of the word is, is for the edification of the saints, and we just ask that you would use this time this morning to build us up in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's do this. So here's the truth. We're talking about drugs this morning. We're talking about All kinds of drugs. How many nurses in here? One, two. Uh, I know there was a couple other people that aren't here today that are nurses. Uh, Y'all know what's up when it comes to drugs. Y'all know how powerful they are. Y'all know how strong they are. Y'all know the uses, the benefits, the negatives, all those things, right? I'm not that smart, so we're not going there. But what we are going to talk about is what it means when we talk about drugs and there's a certain word in the, in, the, in the Bible that is repetitive over and over and over in the New Testament and in the Old Testament that is very telling of, about our use of drugs. Now, I'll get a little bit more specific in a little bit, and we are talking about all types of drugs, prescription drugs, Tylenol, uh, and even all the way up to heroin. That's what we're referring to, okay, because... Let's just get down to the point. In the beginning, God made everything perfect. And then sin came in, right? And all of a sudden, uh, the earth took a different shape. We could spend a lot of time on this, but literally the earth and the the, uh, composition of the earth changed. Uh, Plants changed. Animals changed. It's all very evident in Scripture what happened when sin came in, all of a sudden thorns and thistles began to grow. Sin caused the earth to change. And from the, we get all these conversations. We're going to talk about marijuana today. We get all these conversations. Was well, marijuana okay? And all this stuff, it comes from the earth. Yes, a lot of poisonous things come from the earth. Are you going to use them all? You know, like, Hello. There's a reason why things now come from the earth that are poisonous. That wasn't the intention. That wasn't the perfection that was created by God. It changed when sin came in. The earth's composition changed. The uses of plants that used to be perfect are different now. And so we can claim all we want to that God created this and God created that. He probably created it in a different form and sin changed it. Woo-hoo. If sin changed us, don't you think sin would change a plant? If sin caused us to no longer be eternal the way we were intended, don't you think sin would have crept into the ground? And it's there in scripture. We can refer to it later. Here's what you need to understand. When we talk about hard drugs, I'm talking about like the hardcore stuff, the stuff you definitely want to stay away from. We're talking about gateways into a demonic realm. There are instances all over the Bible where there is mention of demons and spirits. And whether we want to accept it, believe it or understand it, this world is only the dimension we remain in. 
There's another world we cannot see. The Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. So we think heaven is just one place. The Bible says he created the heavens, plural. There's another realm we can't see. Not just heaven, but a spiritual world we cannot see. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but of principalities and rulers in the darkness of this age. We can't see what we're fighting against. We don't wrestle with each other. We're dealing with the spiritual attack that's trying to cause conflict. Whenever there's conflict in your family, understand it's spiritual. Whenever there's conflict at home, understand it's spiritual. Earlier, we were talking with the team, and it said that Jesus stopped abruptly and began to pray. That's what you need to do. When things like that happen, you need to stop abruptly and begin to pray. You know why? That stuff is spiritual, and the only way to attack spiritual is to go at it with spiritual. You got to pray. Here's what you need to understand. The word pharmacy, where we get the word pharmacy from, is derived from a Greek word called pharmakia. This word is translated in the Bible as sorcery and witchcraft. I'm going to read, I'm going to re-say that. The word pharmakia, where we get pharmacy, where we get the word pharmaceuticals, is translated in both the New Testament and the Old Testament in several different Bible translations as sorcery or witchcraft. So when the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, that word is pharmakia. That word means drug use or sorcery or divination. We're going to get deep into this. The word in the Strong's definition, the Strong's, by the way, is like an uh, encyclopedia for the Bible. The Strong's definition of the word is medication, magic, sorcery, or witchcraft. That's how it defines pharmakia. Thayer's Greek lexicon for the Bible says that pharmakia is the use of administering drugs, poisoning, sorcery, magical arts, deceptions, and seductions of idolatry. Vine's Expository Dictionary, the word pharmakia says this, primarily signified the use of medicine, drugs, spells, then poisoning, then sorcery. In sorcery, the use of drugs, whether simple or potent, was generally accompanied with incantations and appeals to occult powers. It's crazy, right? This is the word pharmakia, where we get pharmacy, pharmaceuticals, drug use. In the Bible, believe it or not, drugs are an ancient thing, okay? They've been around a long time. There's always new stuff popping up, but it's been around forever. The word pharmakia is found several times in the New Testament in addressing the church at Galatia about the deeds of the flesh. Paul, the apostle, saw his own people in Galatia using drugs, and this is what he says. Go ahead and throw up that first scripture. This is the New American Standard Version, Galatians 5, 19 through 25. It says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. What's that word next? Sorcery, which that word right there is pharmakia. He's talking about drug use. Enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These things are what Paul was dealing with in his own church in Galatia. See, here's the common misconception, that everyone in church is perfect, they're holy, they're all going to heaven, there's nothing wrong with them. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. And in fact, if you look all through history, all through the New Testament history, Paul and, and Peter and James and John, they all have to correct things constantly in their churches because people end up doing weird stuff. I mean, let's just be real. People end up doing crazy stuff. They're like, oh, well, we want to worship this God too, you know, and they have to go correct that. Oh, we want to go and smoke this too. And then he had to go correct them because he's trying to keep them sanctified. He's trying to keep them in the direction that God wants them to be in. Another place it is mentioned is in the book of Revelation, 
throw up that scripture. Revelation 9, 21 in the New Living Translation says this. And they did not repent. You got that one? And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their sexual immorality or their thefts. This particular scripture is actually quite long in its context. It's talking about Babylon the Great, the, the book of Revelation. It's all metaphorical and allegorical, all that stuff, right? Basically, it was like this. There's a one world government that pops up in the book of Revelation that he describes. And the way that they trick people into doing what they ask is by these things. They bring in murder. They make it, they make it common for violence. Are we there yet? Uh, They bring in sorceries, pharmacia, drug use. They make it common that everyone's on drugs. Are we there yet? And their immorality. They make it common that it's okay to be immoral. Moralism is relative. You know, we're there. And then of their thefts. That's already been common for a long time, thievery. And he talks about it in great length in the book of Revelation chapter 9, talking about people that did not repent In other words, it's like this. God always gives you a way out. He always gives you an opportunity to change. Even on your deathbed, he will give you an opportunity to say yes to him. He doesn't give up on people. The only way you end up going to hell is if you choose till your dying breath to reject the very option that God gives you. People talk about this idea of an unforgivable sin about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's not saying one thing one time that you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It's a continued rejection of him all the way to death. That's unforgivable because you don't want his grace. And so what I'm here to tell you this morning is it doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what you've tried, what you smoke, what you've done. There's always a new day. Today is a new day. Here's the point blank thing. Pharmakia, that word, is a tactic. It's the sorcery. It's the influence that has deceived people into following a satanic system. No, the devil's not a little red thing on your shoulder trying to tell you what to do. He's got a much bigger plan. But I believe that God is bigger and the devil is still small. He's just not that little thing trying to tell you what to do. Some of that is you. Some of that is your past. Some of that is is things you've done. But here's what you have to understand. There is a system set up in this world spiritually that is its whole goal is to entice you to fall into its trap. And one of the big ways to making you fall into a trap like that is by the use of drugs. Anybody here ever been like, I'm not talking about like hard drugs. I'm talking about like NyQuil. I don't know about you, but I'm allergic, I think, to NyQuil. I take NyQuil, I start hallucinating. I kid you not. I'll be there, oh my gosh, there's a taco chase in me. Oh my gosh. I hallucinate with with tacos. (laughs) No, no, no. I hallucinate with NyQuil. I cannot take NyQuil. It doesn't put me to sleep. I stay up. It's got a reverse effect on me. It's so weird. And believe it or not, you can't even drive if you're on NyQuil. There's enough medicine in there that they will pull you over and give you a ticket for DUI because you are under the influence of another substance. You cannot drive if you're on NyQuil. I kid you not. Some of this stuff is strong stuff, man. I can't take medicine. Like the only thing I can take is like a Tylenol or an Advil. Anything else messes with me. When I ruptured my Achilles back... Last May, not this May, but the previous May, I was in bed, in pain, and I took some of that pain medicine. I forgot what it was. It was some hard stuff. It was bad. I don't remember who I was. (laughs) Like, it was the weirdest thing. I don't react well to medicine. And I just stopped taking it. I think I took it for like two days, and I couldn't handle it no more. I said, I don't even know what happened yesterday. I can't take this stuff. And so I just sat there in pain and dealt with it until it went away because drugs are powerful. 
So let's be clear. We're talking about harmful drugs because there are drugs that are useful, right? If the drug's purpose is to take away pain or disease, then it's useful. I can see people in the hospital, they're dying, they're hurting, they're in pain. Yes, you need to give them something to ease the pain. Uh, But there are drugs that their purpose is to deceive you into experiencing more pain or disease, and those drugs are harmful. Here's the real issue when we're talking about drugs in general. We're talking about self-reliance. Earlier we were singing that Jesus is our cornerstone. But in order to get through the day, we need three prescription pill bottles. If you're dealing with something like that, I want to challenge you to put your trust in the right place. I'm not at all advising people to stop taking medicine that they need. What I'm saying is learn to not be self-reliant or dependent on the drugs. Learn to have a dependency on God, knowing that he is your healer. Knowing that he is the one that can take away every disease. That's what the Bible promises. We've got to trust him with it. Who are we trusting? There are people that I know that have been on prescription drugs for years. It's not that they just needed it to get through a certain period of their life till they were able to overcome a situation. No, no, they became dependent. And a lot of these drugs have built in dependency things. They want you to keep using as part of the industry. It's part of what makes the world go round in the pharmaceutical industry. A lot of these drugs are addictive. If you, Everyone's heard the jokes about watching uh, drug commercials, right? They have the long list of side effects and possible issues that you could have, but your head feels better. Your leg fell off, but your head feels better. You know what I mean? It's just, it's crazy, okay? So you've got to understand that those things can be useful for a period, temporary period of time. You cannot depend on those things. You've got to learn to depend on God. We have learned in our culture to depend on man for everything. We depend on man for everything. We have to learn to depend on God. The world is addicted to drugs, legal and illegal drugs. Pharmaceutical companies and drug cartels are among the richest and most powerful organizations in the world. America, believe it or not, is the most medicated nation on earth. 70% of Americans are taking prescription drugs. Hello? 70% of us are taking prescription drugs, yet we have worse health outcomes than other countries. Does that make sense? No, no, it's just we've got the money to go be buying all this stuff that's supposed to take away everything instantly. It's just supposed to help us get through the day. It's just supposed to help us sleep. It's just supposed to help us wake up. Like, we got a pill to put us down. We got a pill to pick us up. Like, what is going on? Most of the country is on some sort of drug. This is crazy. How do we live a life of faith and trust in Jesus if we depend on those things? I'm not talking about the guy in the hospital that is hurting and just got out of surgery and needs something to survive. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about our dependency on things that people make to help us cope when we've got to learn to give things to Jesus so that we can overcome. The United States is facing an epidemic proportions of addiction. That is widespread across all races, cultures, and socioeconomic backgrounds. It doesn't matter where you're from, what color you are. We've all got a problem. Despite tough anti-drug laws, and a recent survey shows this, the United States has the highest level of illegal drug use in the world. Addiction to drugs is a scheme of the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy humankind. This is the same ploy Satan has been using since the beginning, though. Remember, nothing is new. 
There's nothing new under the sun. So where does the origin of, of all this stuff come from? Where does the origin of this dependency on something else rather than God come from? We've got to go to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, it won't be on the screen because it encompasses too much. We see that the Lord God planted a garden toward the east. Where do most drugs come from? Most drugs come from plants or oils or something like that that comes from the earth, right? Very few things out there are just, you know, created. They've got stuff out there now that's just created in a lab, nothing natural. It's kind of crazy. But most stuff that everyone's been used to, in some way, some form, it comes from the earth. We see that the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. God put man in the garden of Eden to watch over and tend it. The Lord God warned Adam that he may eat from any fruit, from any tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if he ate of this tree, he would die. That's a wonderful experience, isn't it? You can have everything but that one. It's kind of how life is, right? You can do all this stuff, just don't do this. This will mess you up. Later, the serpent comes into the garden in chapter 3 and seeks to entice Adam and Eve to eat that fruit. The enemy had one goal, to do the opposite of what God said. That's all the enemy's goal ever is. He wants you to do the opposite of what God says. If God's trying to get you to do this, guess what the enemy's trying to do? No, 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 no. do the opposite. Whenever you hear something in your ear that's trying to get you to the opposite of what you know is right, wake up. That's from the enemy. In chapter three, he seeks to entice them and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, the tree that was not needed to even sustain them naturally. First of all, they were perfectly fine without that tree. They didn't need it. They've never touched it, but they're perfectly fine. So why even go and touch it? Why even go and play? Why even go and pretend like it's useful if you are already existing perfectly well without it? It was not needed to sustain them. It was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it had to do with the expansion of their consciousness. It would have to do with the expansion of what they understood. There are several lies here regarding the eating the forbidden of fruit. First of all, the enemy told them, if you eat it, you won't die, which is the first lie. Because God said, you will surely die. Then the enemy said, you would be like God, which is a lie, because they were already like God. And then it says, you, her eyes would be open, but only to realize her shame. Once, once her eyes were open, she, he, he promised her that her eyes would be open to more knowledge, but the knowledge that she received was that now she had rebelled and now is in shame. She did not become omniscient like God. She became shameful of her disobedience. Did Eve make a mistake? Yeah, but I think Adam made the bigger mistake. Because nothing happened until Adam ate it too. Did you notice that in that story? Nothing happened until Adam ate it too. Who was the command given to? Adam. And there goes Eve being used to try and trip up Adam. And he probably had an opportunity to stop this. But he went along anyways. We could speculate all day long of how all that went down, right? We could speculate all day long. But here's the bottom line. That forbidden fruit always represent lies. Always. We have forbidden fruit in our culture in this day and age. And it is what the enemy uses to deceive us. We are deceived when we think we need medication 
that doesn't really sustain us naturally. We are deceived when we think that we have to have this pill or that pill to get through the day when we know from Scripture that if we lay down our burdens to him, he will replace those issues with his way of life. We have to understand that us being dependent, not a temporary thing that you need to get through something. I'm talking about a lifestyle of dependency on drugs. We know from that is forbidden fruit that equals lies. Just as Satan got control of Adam and Eve through deception, he is trying to do the same thing to the human race on a mass scale. It all came from the beginning. Come and try this. Your mind will be opened. You'll feel better. You'll have an experience you never thought you could have before. You'll be like God. It all stems from the beginning. The offer of mind expansion through forbidden fruit is still happening today. In Galatians chapter 5, which we read earlier, it states that those who partake in this pharmacia will not inherit the kingdom of God. In Revelation 9 that we read earlier, it speaks of people that were not wiped out by the plagues, continued to worship demons, and did not repent of their murders or their witchcraft, which was the pharmacia, or their sexual immorality. The use of drugs is always connected. I'm talking about the hard drugs now. The use of those hard drugs are always connected to the worship of demons and to sexual immorality. Furthermore, those who partake of mind-altering drugs will not inherit the kingdom of God according to Galatians chapter 5. But how many of you know that when a person who's given their life over to hard drugs walks into the same room where Jesus is, things change. Anything can happen. Things change change throughout history medicine men shaman voodoo priest and brujos y'all know who those guys are have used drugs to enter the spiritual realm in fact to this day native americans take peyote for spiritual purposes they claim it connects them with god timothy leary a professor from harvard began to introduce young people to psychedelic drugs He gave them LSD and DMT in an effort to expand their minds. Leary was uh, basically referred to as the Pied Piper for the 60s moral revolution. There were more people, there are more people using drugs today than the 1960s though. It just grew. You know what he did? He went around Harvard campus, I kid you not, Harvard and he passed out LSD. He passed out DMT. He gave it away. He just gave it, hey, this is going to help you study. This is going to help you learn more. This is going to help you, your mind to be opened up. He just gave it away. And he spread this dependency. He spread this addiction. He spread this desire and this taste for these kinds of drugs. The battle cry of the hippie movement of the 1960s was, if it feels good, do it. Have we changed much? With no standard of morality, unrestrained passion led to debauchery, free sex, and drugs. Doing their own thing and following their own desires to be like God was the same temptation that the serpent used in the Garden of Eden. These drugs were used to make contact with the demonic realm. Albert Hoffman is the Swiss chemist that discovered LSD in 1939. In his book, the LSD, My Problem Child, he describes an experience being demonized while using LSD. Can you imagine that? The guy who created it, the guy who discovered this is what this drug is and does, talks about how he was demonically oppressed because of it. And he goes into great length, and it's pretty crazy. Here's an experiment that happened. Rick Strassman, a medical doctor specialized in psychiatry, with a fellowship in clinical pharma, uh, psychopharmacology, I can't even read this stuff, it's so crazy, was a professor of psychiatry for 11 years at the University of New Mexico. He was permitted, check this out, he was permitted to administer this drug called DMT to humans 
for research from 1990 to 1995. For five years, he got paid to give people drugs at this, at this college. And at the University of New Mexico, they gave it to these people and they got paid to take it. <laughs> it was a paid trial. He got paid to do the test and the people that came in to receive it got paid to take it. Okay? DMT has been used by Amazonian Indian cultures in religious rituals for thousands of years. In 1931, DMT was first synthesized in a lab. This was the first legal study of psychedelic subjects in 20 years. He studied over 60 people who volunteered for the study for compensation. And Strassman wrote about his experiences and those of the volunteers in his book, Later, they filmed it, and they called it the spirit molecule. You can go look that up, by the way. Here's what the most interesting thing was about that whole experience. 60 people they, they studied, and himself included. Everyone reported contact and communication with what they believed were real intelligent beings. Another similarity is that the subject came into contact with some sort of alternate reality, another plane of existence. These consistencies of other worlds and their inhabitants were reported regardless of their age, their gender, their language, or religion. He, they would bring them in one at a time. These people never even saw each other. And he would study for five years. He studied 60 people. And the consistencies were crazy. They all experienced the same stuff. They all saw some sort of other figures. They all felt like they were in another world. Rick Strassman stated that both he and the volunteers in the DMT studies he conducted felt that the most intuitively satisfying explanation of these experiences was that DMT somehow allows a person to perceive genuine parallel realities inhabited by independently existing intelligent beings. They think they saw aliens. <laughs> That's basically what they think. What they were seeing were demons. What they were really experiencing were demons. Psychedelics like DMT, magic mushrooms, and LSD open the door to that realm. That's what they do. They open the door to that realm. We have not really understood the full capability of our brain. Science is trying to figure it all out, but no one really understands how every part of the brain works. It's connected to the spiritual because we are spiritual. And we can't discredit that. We are spiritual. So what about marijuana? Marijuana is a mild psychedelic. Cocaine, meth, and other drugs are mind-expanding drugs as well. These drugs fall under the category of psychopharmaceutic drugs. They open that same gate. They, people who are on these drugs experience the same things. LSD is sometimes called instant zen. PCP is called angel dust. Mushrooms are called divinatory fungi. They all have spiritual names on top of it. And alcohol is called spirits. Why? They all have spiritual names. Have you noticed that? It's weird. Even marijuana causes us to have thoughts that are not our own. And alcohol gives us a propensity to do things that we would not do if we were sober. Have you ever wondered why we choose to give our control away so freely? Mariah Freeman is the former executive assistant for Don Wilkerson, brother of David Wilkerson, founder of Teen Challenge. This is part of her story regarding demonic activity while she was on drugs. I began using drugs at 12 years old. The major demonic activity started pretty much instantly. At 13, I attempted suicide due to feeling worthless. I wasn't even on drugs at that point. I was diagnosed with a lot of mental illness, bipolar, depression, borderline personality disorder. I was put on a lot of psychotropic medication, which I believe caused even more demonic activity and more suicide attempts. So the drugs that they were trying to help her to get off drugs were actually making her feel more inclined to kill herself and feel even more less of a human being. 
One night while laying in my bed, I felt a cold, strong presence. A deep voice started talking to me. He said I was worthless and that God wasn't going to save me. I was so scared. This was when I may have been 18 years old trying to get sober. I have many suicide attempts in my past and all of them I believe were demonically led. Sometimes I just felt this urge so strong to kill myself. It was my mission in life to die. Sometimes I would hear a voice tell me what to do and how to do it. While getting clean at the Walter Hovey home, I experienced major oppression. Every night I would lay in my bed and know what was coming for me. Demons would jump on my bed and take my pillow and try to suffocate me. I would wake up gasping for air and literally feeling the weight on my body. One time I saw a demon with a cape while I was using the bathroom. He was standing right behind me and it was like I was stuck and couldn't move. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And drugs led to this demonic possession, which led to my insanity, which almost led me to suicide. Now, she's a drug counselor, helping kids get free, because Jesus came into her life and saved her. The enemy is telling the same lies that he did in the garden. First, you won't die. Drugs sometimes make people feel invincible. They have this effect. Secondly, you will be like God. People use drugs to become connected with nature or be connected to God, they think. Thirdly, the knowledge of good and evil, the expanded consciousness brought on by eating that forbidden fruit. All these things are lies. Finally, you will be like God. The enemy told them that they did not need God telling them how to live. They were their own God. And while on drugs, many people feel so invincible that they feel they have superhuman strength. Some people jump off buildings or drive into other cars believing that they're, they're going to be okay. Have you ever noticed that drunk drivers usually are perfectly fine and yet everyone else is injured or dead when they get into a car accident? They have this feeling of invincibility and, and like they, they have this strength because they're on something that makes them feel superhuman. The devil is a liar and he has been lying from the beginning. The world system is set up against the kingdom of God. In Revelation 18, the Bible says, And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in you. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in you. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. And by your sorceries, pharmakia, were all nations deceived. That's what it says in the book of Revelations. Your merchants were are the great deceivers of the earth. Those be drug dealers, legal and illegal. Sorceries are the drugs that are the tool of these merchants. They are the tool of these people who sell them. Through this sorcery, they deceived nations. That's what the book of Revelation says. So here are my final thoughts. I'm going to go ahead and get the team back up. Here are my final thoughts. What do we need to have when we're talking about this stuff? Because it's very clear from scripture that giving yourself away to any of these drugs is both forbidden and it's just not a good idea. It, it basically is you saying, I'd rather give control to this in my life than to God. It's depending on something that is man-made versus God himself. And so what we all need to have and what we all need to have concrete is a word called discernment. Discernment is the ability, hear me clearly, to hear the voice of God when the flesh is trying to negotiate with you. I'm going to say that again. Discernment is the ability to hear the clear voice of God when everything else is trying to negotiate with you and say that it's okay. You can apply this to anything. Discernment 
is the distance between God's voice and the echoes of this world. When this world is trying to get you to do this and to do that, and it's okay to experience this, it's okay to try that. Discernment is the distance. It, it, it's what helps you find God's voice in the middle of that. And you need God's voice. You need God's voice. You need his presence in your heart, in your mind. Discernment is what helps you find God's will in the middle of every situation. You need discernment. Hear me clearly. If you don't live in your purpose, you will live in perversion. I'm going to say that again. If you don't live in your purpose, eventually you will live in perversion. You will find a way to feel good about yourself because you're not living in your purpose. So the goal of the enemy is to try and make you feel like you don't have purpose when God clearly says you have purpose. You can say it this way. If you don't live in your calling, you will live in confusion. He, God wants you to live in your purpose. He wants you to live in your calling. The enemy wants you to live in perversion. He wants you to live in confusion. If you don't live in your destiny, you will live with dissatisfaction. If you don't live out everything that God's called you to do, if you don't even step towards your destiny, you will wake up dissatisfied. And you will seek something to make you feel good. You will seek something for gratification. You've got to live out your purpose. You've got to live out your calling. You've got to live out your destiny. And in the middle of those things, you will find him. God wants to break chains of addiction. He wants to break the chains of dependency on other things. Let's stand this morning. Real quick, I want every person who has a family member that you know is dealing with drug use, drug addiction, that you know is an alcoholic, that you know is addicted to something that is destroying their life. We want to pray right now in Jesus' name for freedom in their life. Come on, pray for your family right now. We want to pray right now for freedom completely, 100% freedom 100% liberty in their life we break every chain of addiction every chain of of the lies that they've believed the deception of these drugs the deception of pharmacia the deception of what they've got themselves entangled with father we declare that they would have an experience with you that they are they are found worthy in your presence god that they would experience who they are with you father god that they would not believe these lies any longer we just declare right now for every person that's represented here complete and total freedom Freedom in Jesus' name. Complete, complete and total freedom. We thank you for it. If there's anyone here this morning that you haven't committed your life to Christ, you haven't said yes to Jesus, you, you know about him, you, you, you know what he teaches, you, you know who he is, but you, you haven't said yes, you haven't dedicated your life to God, you haven't said, I want to live for you. I want to give you that opportunity this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you say, you know what, I want to be made new. I want to become a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to serve him with my whole heart. I want to be born again. If that's you this morning, on the count of three, I want you to lift your hand. One, you'll never be the same. Two, He's with you right now. Three, do it. If you're here this morning and that's you, I see you. I see you. Father, we thank you for it. I just pray right now for that person that raised their hand. I ask that you would just cover them right now with your presence, cover them with your spirit, continue to develop them, continue to lead them, continue to help them grow. I ask that your presence would overtake their life and everything that they do would be felt with you in it and they would not know a day without your presence in their life. We thank you for and we ask that you would just do this in Jesus' name. Can somebody praise God this morning? Amen. Can somebody praise God? We thank you for it. Amen. Man.
Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us for this week's podcast from Pursuit City Church. Our vision is to plant churches that are life-changing. If you would like to support this ministry, you can easily do so by visiting our website, PursuitCC.com. Also, follow us on social media at PursuitCC. Have a blessed day.